Hello, and welcome to Head 2021. For those of you who have not met before, I'm David Coronado, I'm with the Lemelson Foundation. Over the past six years, the Lemelson Foundation has been working to unite a community of invention education leaders where we can work together because we believe in the power of people coming together and the problem solving together. I'm glad we get to celebrate our fourth annual convening of our community day, but this is the first we've actually done online. I am glad that everyone's staying home and being safe in these times, but I do miss seeing old friends. There's usually lots of hugs being shared around this time. However, I'm excited this new format has really allowed us to bring new voices into the conversation. We're always looking to expand our community even further. There's a great quote that speaks to never letting a pandemic go to waste, and we're certainly not today. This year, we've added a new program called Invent Head Inspire, so new program partners can join us each day in our plenary sessions. For our Inspire guests, I really do want to issue you a warm welcome. I hope you'll join us in our work and consider being part of our community. I know for me personally, this event brings me so much joy as you work year-round to make this happen. It's exciting to see so many folks who are committed to our youth, especially those who are often shut out. I know we have a lot of work ahead of us that needs to be done to address the inequities our, our young people face every year and every day, especially those with different abilities whose skin is a different color or whose gender might be different than others. I'm really glad that you are here to be part of the solution because we truly do need you. We have people joining from across the country and around the world. To those in other parts of the world, thank you for staying up to be part of this community. I see Singapore, India, Kenya, Canada, and many others. I encourage everyone to put in the Attendify chat where you're viewing from. I know that I was looking earlier, I saw some of you have already shared whether your weather is great or not. We'd love to continue hearing from you even further. To give you a sense of who is online with us, we have K-12 educators, district and state education leaders, federal government colleagues, corporations, foundations, university researchers, museums, out-of-school time program providers, and so many more. But why are we here? There's no better way to answer this question than to hear directly from our community members in this short video. So I think the biggest challenge we're facing in education is we have been iterating on a over 100 year old education model for a long time. In some ways we go 12 years of teaching our students how to hammer, but we don't teach them how to build. When we look at the challenges we face today and the opportunities for the future, all of that is wholly dependent on the next set of inventions and innovations we bring about. The problems require complex solutions, and they require knowledge from different disciplines. Creative problem solving is what will be required of them in almost any job they might go into. Students that can communicate, work collaboratively, be critical thinkers and problem solvers, Invention education is it's sort of like problem-based learning. Here's your problem. How are you going to fix it? So it really is about putting context around what STEM is and driving more students to be interested through real-world problem solving. Now they realize why is that physics important? Why is that biology important? They are able to take an idea and see that idea through several iterations, but there's also a lot of failure built into that. We take that and we say, how are we going to pivot on it? How are we going to change it? They got to work on problems that mattered to them, that were interesting to them. And what I heard from kids a lot is they felt heard and recognized and valued. If I were to boil down to one word what we provide in adventure education, it's confidence. The change that I saw was my students felt empowered. They felt that they can do this. They, they, had, they found the internal drive that they didn't think existed. Ultimately, the students are getting a chance to practice those essential 21st century skills, workforce development skills, because we really don't know what the jobs of the future will be. Especially as education systems evolve globally, uh, the skill sets of creative thinking, critical thinking, hands-on learning are particularly important. 
In Kenya, youth are really used to didactic learning, where the teacher goes in front of the classroom, um, writes on a chalkboard, and then the students copy that down and repeat that for a test. Now what you see in the workforce is the need for more than just technical skills. You need to learn how to work across teams. With the global problems that we face today, it's really vital that youth are able to work globally to tackle these problems. The conversation that we are having now is about what we know works, how we can communicate that to other people. The Invention Education community draws upon people from all kinds of different disciplines. You have people from government agencies, you have people from grant organizations, you have people from businesses, you have educators like myself. In an invent ed framework will, I think, really empower us to fill in the gaps from different stakeholders, different kinds of experts to really make InventEd take off in a school setting. We're working hard on creating problem solvers, but in addition, the world needs problem finders. And I found that instilling that in my students will really help them develop as human beings. We want them to not only be great citizens, but global citizens and change makers all around the world. It's great to hear from so many of our network members. Prior to joining the foundation, I spent many years directly working in the field and at the foundation talking with people in all different sectors. And we we're hearing, hearing similar themes on needs. We need to solve some key issues in the US and around the world, such as climate change. We need to prepare our youth for a rapidly changing innovation economy. We are seeing talent shortages in the workforce we need, and there is a clear inequity in who is allowed to problem solve. Our global community needs a diverse pipeline of future inventors and problem solvers. We need to work collectively to provide opportunities for all students to experience invention education. Every lost creative youth we do not empower could mean the loss of the cure for cancer, or the next one who helps cure the new pandemic. The Lemelson Foundation has been working to support K-12 invention education for over 20 years, including me when I was a grantee doing invention education with diverse youth. For me, I saw firsthand what happens to youth when you empower them to solve problems they care about, especially those who are people of color like me and who grow up low income. When you are told over and over there is nothing you can do, you begin to believe it but when you help someone take ownership of their agency, it really is infectious. We need all youth to lead their own lives. Regardless of whether they invent, we need all youth to be inventive and be ready for life's opportunities. It was four years ago we began to unite a community focused around the problem on how we might help all youth, regardless of their skin, gender, income level or abilities to develop the skills and mindsets needed to become inventors, innovators and the problem solvers of tomorrow and be prepared for a changing workforce. Now, I'm glad to say we're a growing community that is uniting to bring the promise of invention education to all students. We call this community the InventEd Network. I want to introduce you to my colleague and partner in crime, Erin Toshin, our InventEd Network Director. In a few moments, she and I will share a bit more about the Invent10 Network's visions and our goals for this year. But before we dive into this work, I'd like to share a special welcome message from my colleague, Dr. Carol Dahl, the Lumbleson Foundation's Executive Director. Hello, I'm Carol Dahl, and I'm Executive Director at the Lumbleson Foundation. It's great to be here virtually with all of you today. And let me offer a big welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. We're really pleased to sponsor InventEd 2021, a meeting of the champions of invention education. I believe most of you are familiar with the Lemelson Foundation, but for those of you who are not, the Lemelson Foundation is a private family foundation based in Portland, Oregon. The foundation was established by Jerry and Dolly Lemelson over 25 years ago with the mission to improve lives through invention. Jerry, one of the most prolific independent inventors of the 20th century, had more than 600 patents and he knew the importance of invention in the U.S. economy and meeting social needs. In launching the foundation, Jerry and Dolly saw the need to support future generations of inventors so their ideas could be nurtured and translate into business opportunity and products that improve people's lives. 
I know the last year has been challenging for all of us, and I hope that you and your families have remained safe and well during the pandemic. The coronavirus has really highlighted the critical role of invention. Inventions have been in the headlines almost daily, diagnostics, personal protective gear for healthcare workers, and most importantly, vaccines, just to name a few. It really drives home the point that inventions are key to addressing our challenges both today and in the future. Invention is also a catalyst for economic growth, good jobs, and better lives. Invention-based businesses that discover, develop, and bring to market inventions that reach people disproportionately drive economic growth as well as the creation of jobs, good paying jobs. Building invention capacity will be key to rebuilding our economy post-pandemic with greater resilience. Invention is essential to the future we all want, and we at the Foundation believe we need to support people prepared to invent and systems to allow them to turn their ideas into products and businesses with impact. This is why we're so passionate about supporting the growth of the field of invention education. We're at a crossroads with education. The pandemic has laid bare the significant inequities within the systems that are intended to cultivate our human potential. And to this end, we must acknowledge that we're not realizing the full benefit of invention potential here in the U.S and around the world, limiting our economy, livelihoods, and our ability to address critical problems. The evidence exists. There's a report coined the Lost Einsteins by the press that studies and finds that if each child from a historically underrepresented group within the inventor community, so here I mean kids of color, girls, and students from low-income communities, if they invented at the same rate as white males from affluent communities, we would have four times the innovation in our country and presumably associated gains in economic productivity, new jobs, and problems solved. We believe that all children hold the potential to become inventors and to ensure all children have the opportunity to realize their ability to become an inventor, it's imperative every child be exposed to the opportunity and have the chance to experience inventing starting at a very early age. Once it's not enough, every child needs a path from kindergarten or earlier to lifelong, both in and out of school, to participate in inventing. And we believe the systems must be inclusive and equitable, cultivating inventors and inventions that tap the full potential across the diversity of our nation and the globe. What we've learned from our colleagues in the field, many of whom are here in this audience today, is that there are lifelong benefits from invention education, whether students go on to become inventors or not. The experience is life-changing. Invention education serves as a catalyst for students to become deeper, deeper engaged in learning, especially in the STEM fields. It builds confidence in students by creating a sense of their identity, their abilities, and a new path for their future. And it prepares students to thrive in a future yet to be determined, in jobs yet to be created, in industries yet to be imagined. So not only does it help future inventors find their path, but it also brings the skills and mindsets needed for students to thrive in the growing innovation economy. The InventEd Network is an important catalyst for advancing the field of invention education, and we're excited about the conversations that will be taking place among you all as you join us in this meeting. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Carol, for the wonderful welcome and for making it clear our work here really transcends so many different issues. Finally, uh, let me hand it over to Aaron Toshin to talk a little bit more about the Invented Network. Good morning, Aaron. It's good to see you. I hope you're excited as, as much as I am about all these new and familiar faces we have in our audience today. Hi, David. Yes, it's great to be with you this morning. And I got to say, I'm so happy to be your partner in crime. <laughs> it's great to see so many friends on the line and new ones that I look forward to meeting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to both our Inspire attendees and our members. Thanks for joining us from around the world today. Your being here is what InventEd is all about. And I hope our time together is just the start to many more conversations. As David noted, I'm the InventEd Network Director, which in a nutshell means I work to implement strategy, programs, and support community engagement for this network, for all of you. 
So David talked a little bit earlier about the work that's been started to build a diverse community to address the challenge of helping all students develop the skills and mindset to become the inventors, innovators, and problem solvers of tomorrow. This community, the InventEd Network, envisions a future in which invention education is mainstream and integrated across K-12 classrooms and programs nationally, and where intentional collaboration across diverse stakeholders leads to inclusive and supportive pathways for all students to engage in invention education. Underpinning that vision are our core values, which you can see here. This vision and these values come from surveys, one-on-one -on -one conversations, and group discussions that reflect the thoughts, feelings, and words from many of you. And as a true community of practice, we want your feedback. You should have a link in the chat asking for feedback on these statements. Are these right? What's missing? Let us know. We'll be finalizing these immediately following the convening and sharing broadly across the network. And as a true community of practice, there's so much to learn from fellow InventEd colleagues. If you're an educator, a researcher, a funder, or wherever you're coming from, we're here to help you find collaborators for your work in invention education and to collectively work toward achieving InventEd's vision. In 2021, we have four key goals, grow and unite the network, facilitate learning and sharing, incentivize and support collaboration, and communicate with a unified voice to raise awareness of invention education. We'd like all of you to participate in connecting, learning, collaborating, and communicating the value of invention education and to help grow this network so that we can bring the promise of invention education to all students. I know I won't be able to meet all of you over the next few days. I will definitely do my best. So please feel free to find me on Attendify and say hello. And I look forward to meeting all of you in our upcoming sessions. So next, I'd like to introduce all of you to Corey Frazier, who will be our master of ceremonies for the duration of the convening. Corey is the founder and CEO of Uncommon and has been a key partner for Lummelson's invention education work, including leading past convenings. We are definitely in great hands. I'd like to turn it over to Corey to lead us into the day. Welcome, Corey. It's great to see you this Hi. morning. Hi, Erin. Thank you so much. And I am so, so glad to be back with this really extraordinary community. Um, one thing that I um, just especially love about this is that all of you are already doing such a great job of connecting using the tools that, we're, that we have here. So um, I'm keeping an eye on the Attendify session chat. And um, as I would expect from this extraordinary community, we've already got um, folks talking about the impact of the pandemic on their work. Thanks, Jim, for putting that into the chat. And then um, something I loved, and Victor Villegas, I'm going to call you out, but I thought that your post in that chat about how we can um, forge new collaborations and connections. So um, for anyone who's not in that chat, scroll down and look for Victor's note if you're working with students, um, Hispanic um, or Latino students in STEM. Um, let's use this tool to be able to connect and collaborate in the way that we would in real life if we were able to be together. I'm going to do a quick overview of our agenda for the day, um, and, um, and then we're going to talk through some of the housekeeping details that we need to go through. So big picture, um, we're going to be starting off our official programming with an update on what's been happening across the network over the course of the last year. So we have some great videos created by our community to share with this team. Then we're going to take a deep dive into the importance of racial equity and inclusion in invention education. This is a theme that we've been talking about for the last several years, and we're gonna go deep into it this year. And we're delighted to have Dr. Ebony McGee with us to, um, to give us a keynote um, on the topic. At the end of the keynote, we're gonna say goodbye to our wonderful invented inspired guests and the network members will take part in a working session to, to explore how the issues of racial equity and inclusion show up in their individual life, in their work and in their organizations. And then the last part of the day will be spent in breakouts um, led by the network members. Um, we will close out the day for network members with a virtual happy hour. So that should be a fun way to wind up the day. Um, and then on Thursday and Friday, we'll have Invent and Inspire team back with us in the morning 
we're going to focus on the short and long-term future of the Invention Education Network and of Invention Education. And um, the members um, in the afternoon session will be breaking out into sessions to begin to prioritize the work of the network in 2021. To note, um, in addition to the Attendify stream, we would love you to be using social media and connecting with one another there. So we have the hashtag InventEd2021 to track the conversation. So feel free to post there. Would love to hear from you. Um, and um, just be sure to check in with your fellow community members um, if you wanna attribute comments. So great to share ideas, but let's also keep this a space where we can have candid conversations together. So quickly, as David noted, this is a new format for us and we've got some new tools um, that we're gonna be using. Um, what I'd really like to do right now is to go over to a bit of a guided tour that we created of Attendify. It looks like many of you have already figured out how this works, um, but this will just give you a grounding in the tool that we'll be using today. So um, we will go ahead and flip over to that video. Attendify is going to be our home base for the next three days, and I wanted to do a quick virtual tour for you to show you a few key areas that we're going to be using over the course of the convening. So first, let's take a look at Town Hall. This is your home base, um, and anytime you need to come back here, just click on the little house as we go forward, and you'll see a couple of key things as we look at Town Hall. There is a left-hand panel of quick links that will take you to all of the different features and functionality we need as we move forward over the course of the next three days, a quick overview of this convening, and then an activity stream and community pane that I'm going to talk you through as we go forward with this. So first, the activity stream. You can access that here in the center column. You can also click to it here in the far left. This is a great virtual water cooler. So this is a place to introduce yourselves, to um, start up chat around general themes and big ideas around the convening. We will also be posting social media content here that you can use and post to your own social channels. So we really encourage you to check out the activity stream. The next piece I wanna highlight for you is community. This is the most part of any gathering that we do with Invention Education, the people who are here together around the virtual table today. So this community tool enables you to do a quick scroll to see who is planning to attend, who you might run into over the course of the next three days. And also you can search for folks that you wanna connect with directly. So I know that David Coronado is at every Invention Education convening. So I can just search for him here, find information about the work that he's doing with the Lemelson Foundation, get his direct contact information, and importantly, send him a message. So this will come up to him within the Attendify platform. So please do feel free to use the community pane um, to connect with other members over the course of the next three days. The next most important feature that I want to show you is our schedule. So this is always available from the clock icon in the far left. If you go back to town hall, you can again find it in the far left. Anytime you need to pop back in to the invented convening, you can come directly to this schedule and you can find where your session is and click on that session. And when that session is live, you'll be able to directly access the video for that session. You can also, for those sessions, write into the session chat. We will be asking you to put comments and questions in the session chat as we go along. And this is the place that we will also post materials following each session so that nobody has to miss out on any of the content that we covered over the last three days. One final really important piece of information that I want to share with you about the schedule is that every single day at the very top of the day, we will post a link to the tech help room. When you click into this, you will have a link directly to a Zoom link that goes to a staffed room where you can ask any questions that you might have as we go forward. So tech help room is always available. We'll continue to post it in the session chats as we move through the convening. 
Just a quick highlight of a couple of other items. So speakers, you can look for all the different speakers that might be presenting over the course of the day here in the left hand side. You can click on a speaker that you're interested in, get more background on the work they're doing, find contact information, and also find whatever sessions they're participating in over the course of the two days. Finally, there's always a quick link here back to the InventEd site, which is a terrific tool. If your colleagues, if partners have questions about invention education, feel free to share this site with them if they can't be here with us today. This will give them a great backgrounder on what invention education is and what this community is working towards together. Whew. That was a lot of information and a very high level overview. Um, but again, I think that this tool will be a great way for us to stay connected as we go through the course of the sessions today. Um, just one more final shout out. If you ever get lost or need help on this tool or any of the other tools that we'll be using over the course of the next three days, please feel free to drop into that Zoom chat line. You'll always find it at the top of the day's schedule. There will be someone there who can make sure that we um, we address any challenges that you might be having. So now with all of that, I'm really excited to get down to the content. I'm gonna hand it back over to Erin to um, introduce us to some of our network spotlights. So now we'll be going to a few short videos developed by our members to give us a look at what the network has been up to this year. Our spotlights today focus on equity, how we can ensure that invention education is accessible to all students. As you watch, be sure you're using the session chat on the right to share ideas and add comments for the teams. Let's watch. I think sometimes we miss the mark on diversity. We talk a lot about not discriminating. To me, that's the lowest possible bar to reach. When you really think about why do we need diversity in STEM, it's because we need people at the table with their diverse perspectives, their diverse backgrounds, so that we can actually create a more equitable world for everybody. In a socioeconomically challenging uh, environment, a community such as ours, they could not see themselves going into any STEM. We kept trying to find the magic that was going to attract students who were not opting into STEM pathways. Invention education is something that engages young people in changing the world around them. You're modifying your world, and that's a sense of agency. And I think that's something that we haven't afforded, especially to girls and to underrepresented groups. As they progress and they start saying, I'm considering becoming an engineer, and not only that, I'm capable to do more of what I thought I could. That experience really changed the course of my career and in my life. Without having invited me into that program, I don't think I would even be teaching. I don't know if I would have stayed in the sciences. When the door is open for you and people are inviting you in and you see yourself in those spaces, it totally changes not only the trajectory of your life, but it changes the trajectory of generations to come. I've seen one young person go on to be the first to graduate from high school, then college, then graduate school, but then looking back and seeing all their siblings now are starting to engage in higher education. We're actually breaking cycles of poverty. Invention education transcends gender, it transcends culture, where you come from. It teaches these kids that hard work, perseverance, knowing that you're gonna fail, but pick yourself up, you're gonna succeed. Hi, my name is Audros Kukovskaite, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Central Florida. And I'm Christina Sainz, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Central Florida. Our project explores how invention education happens and how different kinds of supports provided opportunities for one of the invent teams to create their invention and to present it at MIT. The students and the teacher at the high school in Oregon collected video and other kinds of data during their invent team year. Over this past year, our research team worked together with the teacher and the student historian to dig through the data to uncover the layers of supports needed for their invention work. 
In this invent ed community, we talk about wanting to create more access to invention education for kids around the nation. So what motivated us for this project was the need to understand how invention education works locally and what supports are needed from the perspectives of the young inventors and their teacher. One of the most important impacts for us has been the relationships and knowledge we developed working together on this research. In terms of invention education, the most important findings that may have an impact on this community is understanding the importance of getting other adults involved in mentoring high school students and supporting the teacher in fundraising. Our evidence shows that it does take a village to create and support opportunities for invention education. Mesa USA envisions a more equitable country where underrepresented students of color are empowered to achieve their dreams through mastery of STEM disciplines to create prosperity in our communities. Mesa was founded over 50 years ago in California and adopted by nine other states over the years. Mesa USA is a consortium of the independent Mesa state programs that collaborate to advance a collective vision and mission. Annually, Mesa USA member programs serve approximately 50,000 students across the country. Last year, a contingency of Mesa State Executive Directors attended Lemelson's Invent Ed Conference and were inspired by Kamal Sinclair's opening keynote address and her challenge to all to consider a world where we design for equity, justice, beauty, and prosperity. While Mesa USA leadership and staff across the country had been focused on providing greater equity and access to academic and career pathways in STEM, the organizations had not yet engaged students in the work of invention for greater access. What if we challenged our students to invent equity? As an alliance, we have held two virtual convenings to extend the focus of our work from Mesa leadership to our Mesa advisors who lead our students through this work. In August, approximately 50 Mesa staff gathered to explore the seven chapters of Kamal Sinclair's Making a New Reality. In December, over 125 Mesa staff and teachers gathered for our inaugural Mesa USA National Conference on Designing for Equity. Kamal Sinclair served as keynote speaker, and each Mesa state had the opportunity to share best practices around engaging students in the critical work of equity in design. Our work is far from over. In June, we will gather virtually to showcase the work of our students at our National Engineering Design Competition. The competition will be followed by another national convening in which colleagues from Oregon Mesa will provide professional development to our Mesa advisors on a curriculum that emphasizes Lemelson's pillars of invention. This was an event that was planned for the summer of 2020, but had to be postponed due to the pandemic. The theme of the Mesa USA National Competition has also been adjusted this year to be Designing for Equity, where students will invent a solution for addressing inequities in their clients' lives. The COVID-19 pandemic and global unrest related to racial injustice have been stark reminders about the many areas of our society that could still benefit from an emphasis on equity, beauty, justice, and prosperity. Mesa USA is proud of our 50-year history of working toward greater STEM equity for underrepresented students. However, we realize that our work calls on us to also engage our students in the work of designing a better and more equitable future for themselves and generations to come. Many thanks to everyone for sharing your work with us. Your presentations were great, and I know there'll be a lot of questions and areas for follow-up. So please um, feel free to reach out to these folks to connect directly and continue the conversation. Next, we have a great keynote from Dr. Ebony McGee, Associate Pro Professor of Diversity and STEM Education at Vanderbilt University, with a question and answer moderated by Dr. Daryl Williams, Senior Vice President of Science and Education at the Franklin Institute. But before we hand it off to Dr. McGee, we wanna give the microphone to a student to share with us his story of how he became an inventor and the impact inventing has had on him. I'd like to introduce Harold Sarmiento, a college student at Western Carolina University. Harold, welcome. I'll hand it over to you to share your story. Take it away. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am Harold. I am a student at Western Carolina University, and I am currently studying business administration and law. 
On top of being a student, I am also a musician as well as an inventor, but being where I am today didn't just happen out of the blue or with uh, dedication. In 2010, I immigrated to the U.S. from Colombia, and although I didn't speak any English, I didn't let that barrier stop me from continuing my love for music and science. Uh, throughout the years, my English proficiency improved, and of course, I started doing better academically and socially, which takes me back to high school when I met with a group of students, uh, uh, dedicated students who came together to brainstorm about local problems and its solutions. And unfortunately, at that time, Florida was going through a rise of Zika cases, so that empowered us to make a change in our community. Um, part of what makes someone an inventor is coming up with ways to better the living of others. And that's what my team and I did. Um, we came up with a device that would help keep people safe from Zika by deterring mosquitoes from breeding, as well as disrupting the development of its larvae and stagnant bodies of water. And thanks to the support of many individuals, I was able to work with this group of students who I've cried with, made memories with, and who have honestly learned to love. And it is vital for me to state the importance of invention diversity, because I believe that anybody can invent. I am here today as proof of that. I am an inventor. Um, and then everyone in my group, as well as me, made this invention possible. All of them dedicated students that came from different ethnical backgrounds, just like me, made the invention, the mosquito agitator device, a reality. And with that being said, um, I came from an, I'm a non, I was a non-English speaker immigrant uh, that came to the U.S. and basically obtained his citizenship and, uh, you know, got a U.S. patent. That is a huge achievement. And that's why I believe that anybody should invent and get the chance to invent. Um, I believe that we can make the world a better place and we uh, want to make the world a better place and we should invent the world. Thank you. Thanks, Harold, for sharing your story. Um, it's such a privilege to hear about your pathway into invention and you underscore why we're all here today. And we all know that you will be making this world a better place. Uh, thank so you. thank you again. So I'll turn it now over to our moderator, Dr. Daryl Williams, to introduce our keynote speaker. Daryl, it's great to see you. I'll hand it great over to you. see you too, Aaron. Thank you. And thank you, Harold, for such an inspirational uh, uh, speech. I'd love to, to talk with you some more and, and get some insights from you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to serve as the moderator for our keynote session today. As a network, we are all in different places in our equity work. Some of our programs were built specifically to address racial justice and equity and invention, while others may be earlier in this process and thinking about how their programs can evolve to better enable Black, Indigenous, and people of color to pursue invention. Collectively, we have engaged in discussions and learnings around these topics at, at previous convenings. And this year, especially following the eye-opening events that took place in 2020, it's essential that we move beyond learning to action. That's why I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Ebony McGee, Associate Professor of Diversity and Education at Vanderbilt University and author of Black, Brown, and Bruised, How Racialized STEM Education Stifles Innovation to join us to share her research and perspective and talk through specific actions that we can take to correct it. Please be reminded that if you have any questions or comments as Dr. McGee is speaking, you may drop them into the session chat at the right of your screen. I will be monitoring this, the chat and will bring questions to Dr. McGee following her talk. So without further ado, let us welcome Dr. McGee. Thank you so much, Daryl. And wow, Harold, I am honored to be sharing this space with you. And I hope that you'll stick around for my presentation because I believe you will see yourself in some of my research. I want to thank Invent Ed community, especially David, Gina, Corey, and all those involved in making this happen. So thank you so much. Um, is there a PowerPoint that you all see? Yes. Okay, great. I see it now. So I'm new to this space called Twitter, and I'm trying to get my social media game up. So in addition to the InventEd uh, Twitter handle, if you could also, if you hear something that you like, at Relationship Gap from my Twitter. All right, I'm going to jump right in. So next slide, please. So guess what? Invention 
according to economics and scientists, is damn near dead. So uh, economic professor Robert Gordon argued that almost everything that we view is new and novel, including the internet, the smartphone, and a variation of these themes. The pace of transformation has actually radically slowed within the last half century. Next slide, please. And he is not alone, far from alone in this critique. In spite of some significant financial investments in research and development, since about the 1970s, there's been a dramatic lower innovation rate. And surprisingly, this was really affirming to me because when I was a little girl on the south side of Chicago, I used to watch the Jetsons. And I always thought that we would soon have the capability to fly in our cars. And these scholars provide some evidence that I might have actually been right. Next slide, please. So when these same uh, educators determine why innovation is practically stagnant, you see some explanations around some familiar answers that emerge that don't have anything to do with race and structural barriers in the society. These scholars even had the nerve to say that everything worth discovering might have already been discovered and shame on them for that because we know that is not true. Also, the author's explanations, the authors themselves were mostly white males and maybe this is the reason that certain theories and th certain explanations remain hidden. Next slide, please. So I had further questions. There are some unasked and under-asked questions re relating to creating innovation and, and fostering innovative identities. So why is there no black, brown, indigenous people of color automobile company? airline company, big social media company. I could go on and on here. And if we decided to get together, find some fantastic investors and pool our money, what kind of resources and what are the economics that we need to know to start the next Google or Tesla or SpaceX or Apple, right? And also what during this time of COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement, folks of color, my research uh, shows that folks of color are really critically thinking about their future and wanting more empowerment over their financial lives and even their mental and physical health. Um, and then we kind of want to disturb that old boys club, which is mostly white, mostly upper to middle class, middle to upper class, and socialize and educate it to believe that not only white males have a superiority, but there is an inferiority that, that plagues black, brown, indigenous people of color. Next slide, please. So in order for me to accurately understand the lack of investment and innovation for BPI uh, POC, I really had to go back to the past. And I know we are always kind of timid of going back there, but you know, really wanted to understand that the patent system has long been the heart of America's innovation policy and long been the heart of inventors being able to invent, as Harold so eloquently uh, showed us, but black, brown, indigenous inventors, both born or forced into American slavery, have largely been ignored. And the patent system consistently excluded these inventors from recognition. But in addition to that, between the years of 1870 and 1940, we lost over 100 patent ideas from the black community. Next slide, please. And Dr. Lisa Cook, a professor of economics, really tried to unpack and explain why this was the case. This publication actually took 10 years to get published, and she had three of the most uh, 
renowned economic professors endorsing the publication. But again, this history is something that we don't like to say this is America. Um, but what she found is that the, the biggest impacts that blocked patents for African Americans was separate, but we know woefully unequal, Plessy versus Ferguson, Black people being terrorized by lynching, humiliated by racial segregation, Jim Crow, and burdened with the contemporary presumptions of guilt and police violence that we have today. So remember what happened during times that Black people were enslaved, the residue is still with us. We still carry the residue. There's a the things have evolved, quote unquote, but you know, they're still detrimental to our society. And Tulsa, which was nationally recognized for its affluent African American community, also known as the Black Wall Street, in June 1921, spurred by Jim Crow, jealousy over their inventions and their success, and land lust terrorized and deputized local police who rioted and destroyed the entire Greenwood area. Historians now say that as many as 300 people died, 97% of them black. Next slide, please. Also, trying to understand the history and how people of color have been oppressed via the policies and practices that don't allow us to patent or even take credit for our ideas, I found the, the work of Isabel Wilkerson was really uh, foundational to understanding that enslaved Black people were actually penalized for their innovations or had their innovations stolen, right? So we will never really know how many innovations that black, brown, indigenous people of color made during that time or even during Jim Crow because many of their inventions were stolen, but even more, many inventions were buried. So what I'm saying is if one had to choose between maintaining a system of white supremacy that says black people are innately inferior and the inventions created by Black people, which of course would benefit all of society, white supremacy almost always wins. So they were times, in her book, she argues, they were times where inventions were just buried, they were destroyed. They, they, they weren't even stolen, they were buried for the maintenance of white supremacy. So understanding that history, I think is important to understanding why we continue to be plagued by the uh, lack of opportunity to be innovate, as innovative as we can possibly be. And of course, we still rise, like Carol showed, and yet we still rise. Next slide, please. So looking back at K-12 and looking through that particular educational paradigm, we really need to understand how a student of color in particular develops a robust STEM academic identity, which I argue in my work is a precursor for thinking of ourselves and having others think of us, key stakeholders, as an, an innovator. Next slide, please. So what I'm arguing here is that we, Black people in mathematics and STEM overall, have to kind of oscillate between a fragile and a robust identity. And what they face in the classroom can be described through the lens of fragile and robust. Now, what I'm saying is we're all fragile. It is part of the human condition. But students of color, marginalized students of color, are placed at fragility, at extra level of fragileness as a result of structural uh, barriers and oppression found through this kind of inferiority complex that I just outlined 
created and maintained during slavery, the residue is still with us. And fragile is described as that kind of delicate, vulnerable position between Black students and their mathematics success and the persistent racialization that they endure in their discipline, where robust is kind of the strength and agency that students develop in spite of their racialization to maintain self-motivated mathematics success. So let me break this down to you. Next slide, please. So we have Tanisha, we have Rob. At the time, they were college students, but I asked them to talk about their K-12 experiences, kind of go back in time and let us know how they got to be the, the high achievers that they currently were in their college. And one thing Tanisha said is that she achieved by defending herself as opposed to defining oneself through embracing mathematics. So she said, I came to realize these people, what she meant were our key stakeholders, college administrator, administrators, teachers, and peers, don't really expect too much of me in this class. And I always kind of had this idea, like, you tell me I can't do it. I want to prove to you that I can. And what I'm arguing is that is a hard way to achieve you know, against the backdrop, the constant omnipresent backdrop of low expectations. Whereas Rob, who had a very similar racialized uh, situation where, you know, they were numbers of white and Asian kids who were always assumed to be smarter than him, kind of figure it out over time that I'm going to continue to do mathematics because it makes me happy. You know, I love and embrace math. And I don't really mess with people who don't believe in me. I seek out places and spaces that believe in my abilities. Now, we know this may be hard to do if there's no one in the school who believes in the abilities of students of color. Next slide, please. The second part of this kind of fragile and robust framework is that you are kind of reacting to these in the moment experiences, sometimes to the detriment of your own success. So when it profess, when it started, when a teacher in high school said to Tanisha, after it was what she considered, you know, a medium level uh, question that he threw out to the class, she said, wow, he said, wow, I can't believe that you got that. Nobody helped you. And can you imagine being in a classroom, getting something right, but also feeling so wrong about it? And what she did is that she spent two weeks and didn't go to the class at all. So this is kind of very unhelpful for her overall mathematics success, where, as uh, Rob says, you know, he also got a very racialized question. How does it feel to live around gangbangers? But he came back. Now, this was a peer. This wasn't a teacher. But he came back with a strong response that kind of still made him feel smart and clever. But again, these strategies that you have to develop to respond to race and racism are problematic in, them, in themselves. So even though I consider Rob robust, he shouldn't have to be going through what he's going through. Next slide, please. And then, you know, even when you're six, both of these students were highly successful throughout their K-12, throughout their college careers, they both majored in STEM intensive fields, so they are smart, you know, no doubt about it, but Tanisha's smartness was kind of bittersweet, so although she made the success, she still had the uh, stereotype working with her in the back of her head that Black people are stupid in math, and that's it, right? And this was going to be her life, not just her education. This was going to be her life, proving that Black people weren't stupid in math through her own math success. Whereas uh, Rob said, you know, I have a larger goal. I want to be a professor. I want to be that Black professor that teaches the children that 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 teaches that Black professor that I never had, right? So in college, he never had a Black professor, and he really wanted to change the landscape. So his larger goal made him feel really much more connected to his math success. So next slide. So what I'm arguing here is that if we have a talented group of Black, Brown, Indigenous students of color, you know, how we need to really focus on how they thrive not simply fragilely surviving through their STEM education. And uh, 
and how after they graduate with their with honors from their bachelor's, their master's, their PhD program, then what? Right. So now what what we're doing now is we are telling uh, BIPOC students to enter a world that has an increased level of racialization, competitiveness, individualisticness. You know, Google just had to pay out millions of dollars to settle some discrimination uh, claims. So what are we prepping our students for? And the goal, often the, the ideal goal is to go work for someone else. And what I'm arguing is that we need entrepreneurial entrepreneurship education and equitable forms of financial capital so we can be the ones who create the flying car company, so we can be the ones to cure cancer, so we can be the ones to have the Mars vacations, which Dr. Jane, uh, Mae Jemison says, we will have the technological capability to go to Mars, but what she worries about is reproducing the same racist ideologies here on this planet and then just carrying them to another planet. So we really need not only uh, BIPOC STEM workers, but STEM workers who, STEM entrepreneurs, but STEM entrepreneurs who are really attuned to, you know, how they've been racialized and how they can create more equitable spaces. Next slide, please. The other way I kind of looked at K through 12 STEM identities is through risk and protection. And this was back in the mid 2000, uh, you know, from maybe 2005 to 2010, where, where blacks were risks, you know, they were, everything was risk or at risk. And they rarely talked about forms of protection in those same communities, in those same neighborhoods. Next slide, please. So, you know, what I wanted to do is say, yes, Black students or students of color are placed at risk, right? They are not born at risk, right? It is the structural conditions that place them at greater risk than their mainstream counterparts. So I wanted to acknowledge that, but I also wanted to acknowledge that, you know, this risk, people of color are not to blame for this risk. This is a outcome of their situation and the ways in which they've been racialized. But in those same communities, in those same projects, you have protective factors. And we don't seem to acknowledge them, believe that exists, or talk about them. And I wanted to do that, you know, in my work. Next slide, please. So it's a lot on this slide. I wish I could describe everything, but I'll just describe the meta themes where students are coming with certain assets. And part of this asset portfolio is them learning what it means to look smart, to be smart, what kind of behaviors do they have to emulate in order for teachers to believe in them. Now, I'm not saying this is ideal. You know, no big black male student should have to walk around with a big grin on his face just so his teacher could not be afraid of him. But these are certain strategies that you, uh, black men, black boys and girls, you know, emulate it in order to maintain a sense of kind of sanity and a sense that their success is achievable while still, you know, fighting off this, this constant racialization. They also had a lot of agency and collectivism. You know, many of the students that I spoke to were, were also volunteers. So if they were in high school, they were volunteering for elementary schools, et cetera, et cetera. So this high rate of volunteerism and the responsibility to give back, again, Harold, I am channeling your work here, you know, is also something that we need to celebrate right? And then when you see that Black guy walking down the street and he's like um, saying rough rap lyrics and he's looking real gritty and hard, we tend to think of that as a risk factor. But that's what he needs to do to make it from his home to school. That is actually a form of protection. So that's why just looking through a white lens will not get at the forms of protection that we really need to be looking at when we're talking about students of color who come from certain neighborhoods and have certain experiences. Next slide, please. You know, resilience is not a do-it-yourself endeavor. And resilience is supposed to be something that you use every day or every hour that you're in school. That is weathering. That's wear and tear on our mental and physical health 
we need external supports, right? So when a child does not achieve, we cannot just say, well, why didn't the parent come to the PTA meeting? Why didn't the child study for the three hours a night that's required? We need to understand what the school environment was like. What was the walk to and from school like? What were the after school programs? Who are the math coaches? What is the kind of summer camps? What is the funding for the summer camps that students of color and low income students can, can uh, take advantage of, right? It is just, what are the two of the tutors? What is the tutoring structure like? These are all the things that we need to take account of because one cannot just be resilient and gritty and expect to just achieve. That's why I hate the stories about the homeless student who made a 3.5 and we want to put him on a pellet stool. He shouldn't be homeless. Like, when are we going to fix that, right? But we like to tell these, these really glorified stories. I know I have eight minutes left, uh, you know, but these structural barriers, they do create certain challenges, but these challenges are more institutional. There are challenges about lack of jobs in the neighborhood. There's challenges about schools being closed. So now students have to walk through certain unhealthy, unsafe territories just to get home. Can you imagine? So when a student shows up to school, let's think about what he needed just to get into the school building, right? There's opportunity gaps. The career guidance is even if you are good in mathematics and you are at a low income, predominantly school of color, the, the, the guidance is to be an electrician, not an electrical engineer, to be a plumber, not a mechanical engineer. Oh, mechanical engineers would be bad. That's a bad comparison. But anyway, to do kind of this skilled labor and not to be the engineers, the scientists, the actuaries, right? So there's really, really limited. And then sometimes they say, just do social work, right? So we're not really providing, uh, you know, proper guidance, proper counseling, you know, lack of understanding how college works works, how you can get like a multitude of scholarships, you know, there's a lack of this. And then they are these dangerous spaces and a lack of mentors and role models. So the purpose of this mapping, the next slide please, is to really provide a more a comprehensive holistic view of not just the risk factors, which are, you know, tremendous and we certainly need to address those, but there are also things that are protective and things that we need to help protect from some of these things that we see here on this slide, where you have a constant threat and the kind of black male stereotype that blacks are dangerous, that you know black teenagers are just drug dealers and thugs. I mean, these are out of the mouths of these same high school students. So they know how in the ways in which they are being stereotyped. And they're saying, if I have to go to school every day, try to learn and try to dispel these stereotypes, you're asking for a lot, right? So even though my book is black, brown, they are black and blue. So now we are understanding that there are mental health consequences and they are physical health consequences, which we don't talk about. It's almost as if it's a premature death, a long life possibly, but a premature death where you have doctors, lawyers, engineers, scientists dying six to seven years than their counterparts because of the constant you know, stress and strain of being high achieving, but not being perceived as high achieving, right? And even in spite of that, what, what these students have a lot is hope. And how can that hope be coupled with the resources that are necessary for hope to aspire into actual achievement? So these are the things that we really need to focus on. The last, next slide, the, the last part, uh, really quick, is I want to say that many of students of color had very traditional goals when I asked them maybe five, seven years ago, like, what do you want to do right when you graduate from your bachelor's, your master's, or your PhD? You know, typical goals. But now, next slide, when I asked them what they want to do, wait. Next slide. Okay, sorry, I, we messed up the slide count. Wow, everything explodes now. There's black in engineering, black in AI. Folks want to be global health policy workers. They want to do engineering plus racial justice, like Harold had saw a community need, a societal need, and he wanted to, part of his 
uh, innovation was to benefit and better society. So I'm so happy that Harold went because he was a great segment into how students are now thinking about their STEM career trajectories. But what do we t what do we market? Beating China, being the superpower, possibly winning the Nobel Prize in Science. Well, you know, blacks haven't won that. We have not had a single. Nobel Prize in Science. So they're saying, you know what, bump this. I want to start doing things that are more entrepreneurial in nature. I want to be an innovator, and I want to do it with a sense of responsibility, not just to impact my field, but to impact society. So next slide. So what I call this, Harold has an equity ethic, meaning that he experienced his own experience of discrimination by being a non-documented student, by the barriers he faced through the language barrier, really, and but also saw the community need and the societal need for uh, to combat this, you know, troubling disease. And he had an empathy, a social empathy. He was empathetic. He had a sense of responsibility. And he really demonstrated his equity ethic through his innovation, but also through a sense of consciousness, a sense of solidarity, a broad recognition of the consequences of collectively shared oppression as relevant to his own personal faith. So although he was not inflicted, he had a sense of linked faith, you know, feeling as one's fate is affected by what happens to others in his, you know, presumably marginalized community, right? So Harold is equity ethic. I hope it's okay if I claim that for you. <laughs> so next slide. So what is my work looking at now? So there's a real fear for not only pursuing entrepreneurship because of the structural barriers, because only 1% of the investors uh, are focused on are, are African American, right? Only 1%. And you can imagine how that implicates uh, their lack of ability to get in investment. So there's a real fear for that, but there's also a fear in simply being seen and viewed as talented, as capable, particularly in a society that has a racial hierarchy that leaves Black and Indigenous people on the bottom of the well. So I'm channeling Dr. Derrick Bell's work in critical race theory. So there's, we, those fears are not in the sky. They're not in your head. These are real fears and we need to really come up with solutions to combat some of these. There's also some fuel in this moment of Black Lives Matter and even in COVID-19 where folks are like, why do I have to rely on being employed to have healthcare? You know, they are really critically thinking about the next stages of their life and really using this moment to kind of reinvent themselves and reinvent themselves for STEM entrepreneurship with an equity ethic. And some of us, like myself, we are ready for the revolution. You know, my Twitter handle is plotting for a STEM revolution with uh, Black, Brown, Indigenous, people of color leading that effort. So what does that mean? That means that we have to dismantle some of the barriers that currently exist. Okay, I'm like less than 30 seconds. So you can read, oh, next slide, next slide. So you can read a lot more about this in my book, Black, Brown, and Bruise, which Daryl mentioned in the beginning. Thank you so much for the shout out. And final slide. I also have free resources. So necessary, would we'll love it if you bought my book, but certainly please check out these two websites where I provide resources to really just say that still in this day and age, even though I talk about, you know, these barriers, being a faculty member is the best job. I probably will retire as a faculty member. I can't imagine doing anything else. So it provides a kind of balanced perspective on what a faculty member means and how to do methodology with a critical sense where we don't further uh, add deficit narratives to Black, Brown, Indigenous people of color. Okay, thank you so much.
Dr. McGee, ph phenomenal. Thank you so much for enlightening us this afternoon. So it was like we went with zero questions that came into this flood of questions. So I'm going to do my best to uh, to to go through them and, and, and get to them as, as best we can. So one question here starts off. So our BIPOC students have to take a defensive approach to education as a result of the racialization and institutionalization of the education system. Some subconscious biases from the adults in the education system create a racialized experience that the students can feel but cannot always identify. How do we make sure that our diversity initiatives are not an umbrella solution but address the diverse needs of our student populations in STEM? Wow, what an excellent question. God, that is so meaty. Whoever asked that, wow. Um, I would first say that we need to trouble this uh, concept of unconscious or implicit bias. So professors are not police officers who need to make split level decisions on whether someone lives or dies or gets hurt or gets handcuffed. Or as we saw with the nine year old sweet innocent baby who was having a, a mental health crisis get get a, uh, what do you call that, pepper spray. Yes, mm -hmm. shameful. Um, I don't feel that professors are as implicit as we like to pretend them to be. I think that professors who spend hours upon hours with their students are exuding just straight up bias, right? So the first thing we need to do is stop hiding behind certain labels like imposterism. So, you know, for, for students of color, it's not imposterism, it's just racism. And you cannot breathe, breathe or yoga yourself out of 400 years of structural racism. So having the proper terminology to describe what it is that we're experiencing, I think is, is critical. And then who needs to be on those diversity committees? Well, first of all, whoever's on them, we need to be paid because we are sick of our, you know, cultural taxation, you wanting us to fix all of the problems that we didn't create for free and then educate the entire community. It needs to be really, really diverse. And what I mean by that is that we need some staff. You know, we might need some janitorial folks on that committee, right? Because racism runs rampant through the university from, and everybody is important. So everyone's needs needs to be addressed. And certainly if we have students on there, we need to have some racial battle fatigue training. So what that means is, so my title has diversity in this title. I am expected to talk about issues of race and racism, and I know how to cope and handle that. You know, I, I'm going roller skating tonight, so I know how to breathe that stuff out. When we're asking students who are already in a vulnerable position, you know, to once again relive the agony and the trauma that they're going through, we certainly need to provide them resources so they can come out of that experience still feeling whole. And I think even though students are the ones that we are looking for, you know, I would tell the student, your best goal, if you are a student and you ask that question, is to graduate. We can do more with you on the other side of graduation or maybe on the other side of of the professorate, then we can we can do with you as a student because it's a very tenuous position. So I would say let let the folks who are full professors who you know really don't have as much to lose to kind of lead these efforts. And so, and you're speaking just as a follow up to your response. So you're speaking primarily from a higher education lens. How does that map to pre college? Ah, uh, okay, so. Pre-college is tricky because pre-college brings in a lot of professional development, right? But the professional development is skewed towards implicit bias. So the, the developer comes in and says, "You do, it's okay. You didn't know what you were saying was racist. And what I'm trying to say is some people know. Like, what, how are we going to address the, the people? And it's not like we're not hunting for races. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. We've all been socialized to drink this white supremacy Kool-Aid. Some people drink several cups. Some people just take a sip, right? So to say in a, in a way where I don't want you to necessarily feel guilty or see white tears about what happened previously, but now I'm going to give you the tools to recognize your bias, to acknowledge your bias, to you know acknowledge the ways in which you've been raised to think 
to think these things. And now after walking out this workshop, you have a responsibility to do better. So I think that's one of the things that we can do on the K to 12 is just get real about, you know, all of this bias can be implicit, not all of it. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and then this next question, uh, I'm sort of jumping around to sort of, you know, make this uh, cohesive here. So one question comes in and says, I, I think more white teachers are needed to who opt into liberatory structures in the classroom, uh, followed by Dr. Mc, Dr. McGee, do you agree? And then the second part of this question is, and what does cultural, cultural competence as professional development look like for white teachers? Okay, so absolutely. Uh, you know, the, the teaching population is somewhere over 80% white. Like we can't do it without y'all. We just simply can't do it. And in some places, so I teach at Vanderbilt. Most of my students are white. I make sure to bring in uh, equal numbers of white and, and people of color research. Because I know Peggy McIntosh, like she reaches white kids like nobody's business. But that invisible knapsack, black students don't need that. We already know. Like, you know, that's not for us. So I bring in things specifically to kind of dismantle white privilege and white supremacy. And yeah, the the help of white teachers to, to validate some of the things that I'm saying are important. There is a real fear of white teachers in general teaching about racism because they don't want to get it wrong. You know, and I understand that fear and there's lots of tools, there's lots of strategies for cultural competence. There is a, a website that I'm gonna try to find before this all ends that, you know, has a whole program of how to do cultural competency, but you gotta stop being scared, right? Cause what you're doing, your silence is not helping, right? So just to ignore it or to minimize it or to only do it now during Black History Month, it's not working, it's not, uh, uh, it's not making our students of color robust, have robust identities that they need to. So you need to try something, but certainly uh, we don't need you to be making up anything. So definitely having those uh, competencies that, you know, are well tested and tried and true are really important. I don't have them on the top of my, my head now because I'm mostly in higher ed, but I will try to find them. before the Sure, time. sure. How do you think, this next question, how do you think that we should be supporting students and their reactions to racism? Is it controversial to be coaching students on appropriate responses on what could be said in response to micro and macro aggressions? How young is too young to be introducing this, if at all? So that's a pragmatic response, but I would just say first, we need to decrease the number of microaggressions that they have to respond to. So even in response, in responding to these things, um, as I said, it's still, we shouldn't have to, right? So we should, students shouldn't have that burden. They have so many other things that they have to deal with. Responding to, you know, the omnipresent racism that, that's in the classroom shouldn't be a responsibility. So with that said, yes, they are students who are experiencing that right now and they need a toolkit. Now how to respond, it's tricky. So I would need to know who your school leadership was, what's the relationship with your teacher, what subjects are we talking about, who are the peers in the classroom, what are the racial demographics, right? Because at sometimes just being quiet is a response, right? And I have to recognize that Sometimes you don't have the privilege to be able to stand up and, you know, come up with a clever response to uh, acts of, of racism. But the biggest thing that students need to know is that the microaggression is the outcome of structural racism. So they need to understand the structures and the barriers, and they need to come together as students of color to share in the racialized experiences and share in some of the strategies. But always looking at individual racism will never make students feel as whole as they would if we talk about the structures of racism mm -hmm. and the individual racism as the outcome of those structures. So this next question is gonna kind of point us back to the focus on, I, I think a, a focus on innovation. And I actually really like this question. It came in from a participant who's from India. 
The question is, I'm wondering what were the affirm, uh, affirmative action outcomes? Did it make the social chasm wider? What are your opinions on this, Dr. McGee? I am of the opinion that it did make a significant difference to us in India for communities that felt they had no chance uh, regarding any opportunities. And I'm curious, you know, as you unpack this question, like what, um, thinking about, you know, the immigrant experience and the impact of the immigrant experience on, um, you know, the current uh, structures here, racialized structures that you've been describing in your work. Hmm. So I don't think that there's affirmative action for entrepreneurship for, for U.S. marginalized students of color. You know, I haven't seen it. Um, I would say for immigrant populations, yes, there are certain mechanisms that they can access in order to start businesses. But some of that has backfired in the Black community. You know, when we think about the um, hair care industry being run by people that don't look, the Black hair care industry being run by people that don't look like us, there's a lot of tension in Black communities who see business owners who don't look like them and they also can can prep, uh, perpetuate some of the same stereotypes as mainstream. So I think we have some work to do. I think one of the things that, you know, I wrote this in a paper called Black Genius Asian Fail, is that we don't even understand how much oppression that we share between each other. Like if we only knew, we could actually coalition build uh, because we have shared commonalities where Black students work tw twice as hard to try to prove the stereotype wrong, and Asian students work twice as hard to try to prove their stereotypes right. And the consequences are the same. They forget to sleep. You know, they're hospitalized for exhaustion, have uh, thoughts of, of suicide, and all kind of issues that overlap between those two communities. And I wish we could do like a people of color coalition where we could just come together on our shared, um, you know, shared forms of oppression. I think that would make some ways uh, towards uh, more entrepreneurial ventures and even joint ventures between the ethnicities. And if I understand the question or try to understand the question that, that just came in uh, regarding that, I, I think what this individual is asking is, did the U.S. affirmative action measures widen the opportunities for innovation um, in some context and perpetuated in others. For example, this person is of Indian descent and has the um, uh, b belief that for Indian Americans or folks of Indian descent that it worked in their favor, but maybe not so in other, uh, in other contexts. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with that by saying that there were some uh, policies that immigrants could benefit from, that that's why I was saying U.S. Citizens, US citizens of color were not able to benefit from these same, affirm I don't know if they're affirmative action policies, but policies for innovation from people who are non-U.S. born. Perfect. And I think we have time for one more question um, before we end this session. And this last question is, in your work, have you run across colleagues who are doing similar work with a focus on Hispanic or brown students that we could use in predominantly Hispanic communities? Yes, there's a lot of work that's being done. Um, so Luis Leva is one of the researchers who's doing uh, Black and Latinx women with a focus on entrepreneurship. There are others too. It is really interesting with Latinx that the numbers are actually significantly higher than, than African Americans. And we as STEM educators of color are trying to come together to figure out, you know, what is that possibly secret sauce that Latinx students and maybe their communities and their families have been able to circumvent some of the historic uh, and structural racism barriers to a much greater success, sometimes double. So, you know, you have uh, Black tech at 2 to 3 percent. You have Latinx tech at 6 to 7 percent. Like, neither number is ideal, but they were able to kind of double their numbers, and we're really trying to understand why. Um, so that's some of the research that I'm involved with. But, yeah, there's a, a, a plentiful number of Latinx uh, entrepreneur researchers. Wonderful.
Well, it looks like we're we're pretty much at the end here. So again, we want to thank you, Dr. McGee, for your time and for enlightening us today. Um, I enjoyed this session as well. Thank you all for allowing me to moderate. And I'm going to turn it back over to the team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. McGee and um, Daryl, for your terrific moderation. And to all of you for the really active engagement um, in the Attendify chat, um, a, a great shout out that I think, you know, it's so hard when we're all here together virtually, but um, Valerie at the Henry Ford wrote a note that I just wanted to be sure to share um, with Dr. McGee. I know you can't see us here, but there's so much nodding and recognition with what you're saying. Um, uh, I think that that uh, I think Valerie is speaking for a lot of us on that conversation, and it's why I'm really excited that as a um, as a community, um, we will be able to go even more deeply into this topic in our next round of sessions. So, with that though, I do want to say goodbye to our invented inspire guests. We are so glad that you could be with us today, um, and we are so looking forward to having you with us again tomorrow morning. Um, don't forget, if you're part of the InventEd Inspire group, there's a special um, InventEd 101 session that begins at 9.30 Pacific and 12.30 Eastern um, to get a real um, backgrounder on, um, on the work that's been done to date um, and answer any questions you may have as you're just coming into the world of invention education. For the network members who are with us today, uh, our next session, we're gonna take some time to reflect on the ideas that Dr. McGee shared with us um, and, and really look at how those ideas might play into the priorities that we set for the network in 2021. So for the session, we're gonna be joining on a new link and uh, my colleague Gina is pasting that into the Attendify chat now. Um, you can also look in your schedule and click on the session called, um, we'll start out with Reflect and Connect Working Session. Um, but before we do that, we're going to give you just a quick break. I know we've covered a lot this morning. Um, I encourage you to stand up, physically move around, um, rehydrate, um, and um, while you're up, please grab a pen and a piece of paper as we're going to be using those in the next session. One other keynote, just so you're aware, our next session is gonna be collaborative. So um, unlike in this session where we've been able to uh, watch one, one stream, we're gonna be using Zoom within Attendify so that we can see each other, we can um, break out into smaller groups. So again, you'll find that session link um, in the chat. And we would encourage you to open up that link in um, full screen when you go to it through Attendify. So just so you can get a bigger picture. So again, if you have any difficult um, any difficulty in finding that link or getting into the next session, please feel free to drop by our tech help room, um, and we will make sure that we see you there. But for now, thanks again. It was an incredible morning slash afternoon slash evening, and we really look forward um, to our next round.